Welcome everyone to Science Gallery Bengaluru's fourth exhibition, Contagion. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international network of galleries. We are nine of us across the world, mainly located on university campuses, and we are a public institution dedicated to research-based engagement. In Contagion, which is uh, a full exhibition season, we are trying to explore the idea of transmission, not only of diseases, but also of ideas, emotions, and behaviors. Today's lecture, unusually for the public lecture series, is not in the 6.30 slot, but in the 1.30 time slot. And it is a part of a 23 lecture public, uh, 23 speaker public lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy. Um, and our speaker this afternoon is uh, Michael Brezalier. Um, just give me a second, what just happened? Uh, good heavens. Michael, uh, give me half a second. No worries. Something has gone wrong. Uh, yes, here we are, sorry. So, Michael Brazilier today is going to speak about contagion across species, global histories and ecologies of zoonotic diseases. Before I introduce Michael, allow me to mention our upcoming programs. An early warning, the story of SARS in 2003, a lecture by Thomas Abraham will happen today at 6.30 PM. Human rights and knowledge during crises, a panel discussion with Sandra Bhattacharya, also a historian of medicine with Say Abimbola and Sharifa Sekalala will happen on 11 June at 2 PM. Matter Out of Place, a masterclass with Basish Tidgan, an artist, will also happen on Friday, 11 June at 4 p.m. It is my pleasure to introduce Michael Brezalier after a false start, who is a lecturer in modern medicine and global health at Swansea University. His research examines how international health organizations have shaped knowledge and experiences of health and disease in the 20th century. He's especially interested in the role of the United Nations agencies like the World Health Organization, Food and Agriculture uh, Organization, UNICEF, et cetera, in tackling problems of hunger, nutrition, and infectious disease in humans and animals, and with how these problems have been crucial to projects of development, human rights, and humanitarianism. Do remember that you can type your questions in the Q&A box, and don't forget to give us your feedback because that's what keeps us on track. Over to you, Michael. Yeah, I'll share my screen, I hope. Is that visible? Yes, it is. Great. Um, and let me just get set up here. Great. Um, just a couple. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for that uh, for that introduction. Um, and it's it, it, it's a great pri privilege to um, to be asked to give this lecture and to be. Um, able to participate in this in this timely and, and very important uh, exhibition. Um, now, this lecture is about infections that move across and, or between species, particularly between animals and humans. And these infections have been labeled uh, zoonoses or zoonotic infections. And you will call, I think, uh, that very early on. Um, on, in this pandemic, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, was suspected of being such an agent. And quite quickly, it was thought to come from bats via an intermediate host. Um, now, this hasn't been established, but that's been the theory. And I'm just gonna put a graphic up for you just to sort of remind you of, 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 this, of this concept of this idea. Now, one reason why uh, COVID-19 was suspected of being a zoonosis was that um, an event of this kind uh, had been anticipated for many decades. According to various estimates, zoonotic infections account for up to 70% of all new and emerging diseases in human populations. And these include Ebola, SARS, and of course, avian flu. For many years, the World Health Organization and others have been warning of a zoonosis likely coming out of China or Southeast Asia um, and spreading around the world. But the predicted candidate uh, was not a coronavirus, but a bird flu virus. 
which if it acquired the ability to spread rapidly through immunologically naive populations would become a global pandemic, just as COVID-19 virus has done. So over the last year or so, we've witnessed the world trying to get to grips with a new zoonotic disease. As, uh, as uh, Sheila Jasanoff showed in her opening address of this exhibition, the results have been rather mixed. Scenes of funeral pyres in India serve as a stark reminder of lives lost in every part of the globe and of the collective failure to respond effectively. Now, in some countries, mass vaccination has put a different future with COVID onto the agenda. Statements have been made to the effect that, as the British Health Secretary put it earlier this year, with vaccines and treatments, COVID-19 will, quote, become another illness that we have to live with, like flu, close quote. Now, as an historian of infections and particularly of influenza, uh, this statement ignited a number of questions. What does it mean to learn to live with a new epidemic disease? Can influenza, which we've been living with for a long time now, provide us with examples of how this might happen? And if so, what are these? And can or should the history of one disease serve as a guide, a benchmark, or even a warning for the future of another? Now, one reason to ask these questions is that influenza has become a paradigmatic zoonotic disease. The only one, say besides plague and now COVID-19, that has developed into global pandemics. So my lecture reflects on how we might live with a new zoonotic disease, COVID-19, by looking backwards at how we've come to live with another, influenza. Now let me lay my, my cards on the table, as it were. Flu's history offers instructive examples for how humanity has learned to live with a global zoonotic infection. I don't have any doubt about that, but this history also should teach us how not to live with a zoonosis, what not to do. And hopefully that comes clear in what I have to say. Um, part of my research um, explores how zoonosis have been framed as global health problems. Now zoonoses likely have been affecting humankind since we began to domesticate animals, so for a long time. But it is only recently that the concept of zoonoses has been developed and used as a framework for identifying and addressing infections that spread between animals and humans. Indeed, it's only since the 1950s and 60s through the work of the World Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization and other international agencies that zoonoses have been framed as significant global problems. And this development coincided with and was shaped by the framing of influenza as one of these kinds of infections. What I wanna show today is that the history of framing influenza as a zoonosis intersects with the framing of zoonosis more generally as global problems. Looking at these intersecting histories is important, I think, because among other things, it highlights the assumptions and even agendas in framing as a disease as a zoonosis. Hopefully, um, this allows us to think about the implications of framing COVID-19 as such a disease for how it is represented and understood, for how it shapes public health uh, policies and approaches, among other things. Most of all, historical perspective can help remind us of the enormous challenges in managing a zoonotic disease on a global scale. Now, looking for historical analogies between two different diseases needs to be approached with caution. Uh, as an historian, I kind of have to be very cautious in, in this respect. Despite certain similarities, COVID-19 and flu are different diseases caused by different viruses with different biological characteristics as much as pretty much known. But another issue is that influenza is a disease with many identities. The late 19th century uh, physician, Sir Clifford Albert, called flu the, quote, most protein of protein diseases. And over the last hundred years, as it became better understood, its identities have only multiplied. Think of it. Flu takes the form of pandemics. The last century has seen four, 1918, 1957, 1968, and 2009. 
It takes the form of, uh, it takes form as seasonal influenza, which appears almost every year as a familiar and unwanted visitor. And there are, of course, animal influences, the most notable of which is bird flu, avian flu, which I've already mentioned, which pandemic planners over the last 30 years or so have predicted or anticipated as becoming the next global pandemic. Now, this multiplicity raises important issues for anyone looking uh, to flu as a historical reference. Which flu should we use when making comparisons with COVID-19? Now, I doubt anyone suggesting we live with COVID like we live with flu has had the 1918 pandemic in mind, which killed between 50 and 100 million worldwide, the vast majority of whom were in the colonial world at the time. Rather, it's likely that it's some version of flu that we've adapted to since 1918. And for simplicity's sake, I'll call this, I'll call this modern flu. The suggestion that, excuse me, the suggestion that we might live with COVID as we have with modern flu carries with it a set of assumptions. And in particular, it suggests a specific way of managing our relationship with the disease. Let me just take a quick drink. Epidemiologists char uh, characterize three possible ways of managing this relationship. The first is control. This entails to quote two leading experts, Walter Dowdle and Donald Hopkins. Some people may know them from their work on smallpox eradication. This entails the eradication of disease incident, incidence, prevalence, morbidity, or mortality to a locally acceptable level as a result of deliberate efforts. Now, such, such efforts might include, and do include, vaccination, sanitation, better nutrition, improved living conditions, or in the case of animals, culling sick animals. Control, it's important to emphasize this, control is not getting rid of a disease completely. It is adapting to it keeping sickness and deaths down to an acceptable level, depending on whatever that might mean. This is how we live with most infections, including influenza. But of course, there are other ways to tackle infections. There is elimination, which again, using, uh, quoting Dowdle and Hopkins, aims at reducing the incidence of a disease to zero in a country or region as a result of control efforts. Elimination requires continued control measures to prevent the reintroduction of the disease into the country or region from which it has been eliminated. Some examples, at least from Europe, which I'm more familiar, most familiar with, um, would include uh, rabies uh, for um, yellow polio, yellow fever, and um, malaria, among others. And then there is, of course, eradication, which again, Dowdle and Hopkins as my point of reference, in, involves the permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of an infection caused by a specific agent as a, a result of deliberate efforts so that control measures are no longer needed. Now, only a couple of infections have been eradicated. Best known, of course, is smallpox. There's also the animal disease rinderpest and possibly on the horizon polio, measles and rubella. Most of the world right now is working to bring COVID under control, not to eliminate or to eradicate it. And whether or not control is the ultimate goal remains in question. And I'll return to the implications of concentrating on controlling COVID um, at the end. But for now, I want to turn to flu because its history offers instructive lessons for what is involved in controlling a continually emerging zoonotic disease that has the capacity to become pandemic. For much of the last century, efforts directed at influenza have been aimed at controlling not the disease per se, but the virus or other viruses that cause it. And this has involved three crucial elements. First of all, science, that is understanding the basic nature or biology of flu virus, which largely falls in the domain of virology. Surveillance, understanding and tracking flu virus, uh, how flu viruses develop and spread through human and animal populations, which largely falls in the domain of epidemiology. And of course, vaccination, which relies on science and surveillance to develop and deploy vaccines on a mass scale to keep sickness and deaths down to an acceptable level in, in the human population. We'll talk about animals in a second. 
Now, controlling flu has involved the close interconnection of these three elements of science, surveillance, and vaccination. But once it was framed as a zoonotic infection, controlling flu came to involve measures also targeted at animals. These have included a variety of different measures, but most notably identifying and monitoring animal hosts in reservoirs and their environments, culling or stamping out infected, infectious or susceptible animals, and vaccinating herds. And what I wanna do in the next little bit um, is to give a brief historical snapshot of how these aspects of flu control developed and came together and the enormous organizational demands and challenges um, they involved. First, the science of, sorry, just sort my slides just very briefly there. Um, first, the science of flu viruses. Understanding flu viruses as zoonotic agents has been over 90 years in the making. Its history begins in 1930, when the American animal pathologist Robert Shope identified a virus from cases of swine flu at the Rockefeller Institute of Pathology at Princeton and established its key role in the disease. Shope's discovery spurred work on the specific cause of human influenza, which, which researchers had failed to determine during the 1918 pandemic. In 1933, a small team of British Medical Research Council researchers in London isolated a virus from suspected cases of human flu and soon established it as the primary cause of the disease. These discoveries were wi widely heralded as crucial steps to, towards getting to grips with flu. Everything thereafter came to revolve around understanding the virus, its biology, how it spreads, how it infects and causes disease, where it comes from, and what are its natural hosts and environments. Through the 1930s, researchers around the world pursued the virus with the goal of finding ways to, to produce treatments, but especially vaccines. Yet as researchers shared and compared viruses, they stumbled upon a major new problem. Flu virus was not one virus, but many. The world appeared to be full of virus variants. By the early 1940s, it was becoming clear that rather than being stable or fixed entities, flu viruses were constantly changing. They were mutating and evolving. Antigenic variation, um, as it came to be known, would prove to be the single most important research and practical problem associated with flu through the 20th century. It illuminated old pro problems and introduced new ones. On the one hand, it offered important clues as to how and why flu epidemics developed and why flu returned year after year. On the other, it threw up major practical problems for developing and producing vaccines. How to determine which variant to use in a vaccine for a given flu season or epidemic. Choose the wrong variant and the vaccine would be a dud. To address this, uh, these problems, in 1940, British and American researchers established a system for classifying flu viruses according to their serological type. The three main types were eventually characterized, A, B, and C viruses. While all three in, uh, affected human populations, A viruses caused the most trouble. They would, uh, and they would be linked to all major flu pandemics and most seasonal flu, uh, most seasonal flu outbreaks. The potential problems variation posed to vaccines first became evident shortly after the Second World War. During the war, the US Commission on Influenza led by the virologist Thomas Francis Jr. launched a major push to develop and mass produce a vaccine for American ally and allied troops. The commission provided an organizational model for controlling flu, but it rested on one flawed assumption. Francis and his colleagues viewed virus variation as finite and thus limited. They believed that as long as a vaccine was made from a reasonable cross-section of variants, it would be effective. Not everyone shared this view. Christopher Andrews, who was part of the British team that discovered flu virus, and the, and the Australian virologist, McFarlane Burnett, FM Burnett, saw antigenic variation as evolutionarily infinite and unstable, presenting the real possibility that entirely new strains could emerge in one part of the world and endanger the rest. 
This position was confirmed in 1947 when a vaccine used to immunize American troops failed to provide protection against a large epidemic. The failure was soon explained. The epidemic was caused by a new influenza A variant first identified in Australia. The experience showed that new virus strains could emerge from any part of the world. Virus variation was a global problem re requiring a global solution, a system for tracking flu viruses around the world. In 1947, same year, a group of virologists led by Andrews proposed creating such a system as part of the newly formed World Health Organization. And then on, the, uh, on this slide, you can see a little diagram, a doodle even, of uh, Andrews' vision, his plan for the program. So let's look at, uh, at, at the program itself. The World Influenza Program, as it was first called, was born in 1948 and tasked with constructing a worldwide network of laboratories dedicated to collecting and sharing flu viruses. The program was initially coordinated by two reference labs, one in London, headed by Andrews, and another in Bethesda, Maryland. They worked closely with reporting labs set up by member states for the purposes, the purpose of monitoring and collecting viruses within their countries. The reference labs were responsible for typing and classifying the viruses they received and for determining which variants were most prevalent or circulating around the world. The system was key to forecasting epidemics and supplying vaccine manufacturers with the correct virus subtypes. The prospect that flu virus strains could evolve and vary across geographical regions and that a pandemic strain could emerge and spread from any part of the world meant that controlling flu had to be based on linking vaccination with, the continue, with continuous global surveillance of flu virus, viruses. International cooperation was essential. As Andrews put it during an interview on Woman's Hour, BBC Woman's Hour in 1957, influenza is a confused nuisance, but there is a good thing about it. And that is that to get any further, we've got to collaborate with other countries in order to get anywhere. And I think that collaboration on this sort of level is bound to be the sort of thing that's going to lead to more amicable international relations generally. Remember, we're in the middle of the Cold War here. Andrew's hope was that international cooperation on flu might lead to a better world. Despite the aspirations of the program, Surveillance remained patchy une and uneven for much of the 20th century. National reporting labs were concentrated in the developed world. Developing countries lacked the resources, expertise, public health and medical systems to fully participate in the program. The WHO tried to address these gaps by providing technical expertise, training, lab materials and other resources, but the gaps remain. Vaccine production and supply was even more patchy. Capacities were concentrated in the developed world. By the 1950s, industrial nations had either commercial or state-based vaccine systems with the USA leading the way. However, these could not meet the needs of their own populations, let alone the rest of the world. Two major pandemics in 1957 and 1968 highlighted the patchiness of the surveillance and vaccine systems. The 1957, um, Asian flu pandemic, as it was called. Um, we can maybe talk about the naming of these, um, of, of these pandemics uh, in the discussion. The pandemic likely emerged in mainland China. By that time, the People's Republic was not part of the United Nations and thus the WHO and did not report, report early outbreaks. Strains of the new virus were eventually isolated in Hong Kong in mid-April and then in Korea, Singapore and Malaysia. Reporting delays had a knock-on effect for vaccine production. Crash programs were initiated in the USA, Britain, and elsewhere in anticipation of flu reaching their shores in autumn. While efforts were impressive, all encountered significant challenges. The lead time was too short. Production capacity could not meet demand. Only small amounts of vaccine were produced and only small numbers of people were vaccinated, roughly 17% in the US. And that was sort of the best of, of all the industrial nations. For the first time, the question of prioritization emerged. Government health ministries were faced with deciding which groups should get vaccinated and which should not. The developing world was left out of such decisions. 
When the next pandemic struck in 1968, surveillance and vaccine, vaccine systems were better, better prepared. Virus surveillance included more of the world, but still not China. Technical innovations enabled faster and larger scale um, vaccine production. But once again, flu exploited weaknesses in both systems. Surveillance programs missed the new strain until it became a regional epidemic exploding out of Hong Kong, and hence the name um, of the 68 pandemic, the Hong Kong influenza. Vaccine efforts failed again because production lagged behind the pandemic. Both pandemics were widely characterized as mild, especially when compared to 1918, but the death tolls were not insignificant. An estimated one to four million people died in each pandemic. Yet the burden of mortality was not shared equally. In Britain, the two pandemics claimed an estimated 66,000 lives in total. In the USA, they claimed an estimated 216,000 lives in total. It's likely that most deaths occurred in Southeast Asia, where both pandemics struck first and where poverty, malnutrition, famine, and weak and under-resourced healthcare systems made populations more vulnerable. Inequalities in the global burden of influenza, which are or, and were uh, likely linked to inequalities in access to healthcare resources, have been very much part of the story of modern flu. It's a challenge that has only been very recently addressed. Indeed, it only became a major issue at the end of the 20th century when focus turned to controlling avian flu. So to understand how the system came to focus on avian flu and why addressing inequalities became such an issue, we need to turn to how flu was framed as a zoonosis. Part two, let me just have a drink. Perhaps the biggest breakthrough in influenza science was the recognition that flu viruses affected animals, and most crucially that animals served as reservoirs and hosts from which viruses could spread into humans. We now know that all flu viruses that affect humans started out as animal viruses. Now the idea that this might be the case was first proposed in the early 1930s by Richard Shope. He suggested a possible connection between the 1918 pandemic and an epizootic of so-called hog influenza that broke out at the same time in the American Midwest. Interest in the possible role of animals as flu virus reservoirs and hosts began to be systematically explored in the 1950s and 60s as part of efforts to better understand virus variation. Andrews and Burnett speculated that that the variant that had hampered vaccine efforts in 1947 might have resulted from either recombination with animal viruses or that it directly crossed into humans from an animal source. Both hypotheses pointed to the possible role of an animal reservoir. Now the prospect that animals might be the source of human influenza gave rise to new collaborations between experts and organizations working on animal and human health. Two were especially important. I want to turn to these now. The first was a partnership between the WHO and the FAO under a joint expert committee on zoonosis. The committee brought together the uh, WHO's veterinary public health unit headed by the American veterinary scientist, Martin Kaplan, and the FAO's animal health branch headed by the British veterinary expert, Thomas Dolling. The committee was established in 1950 in response to the World Health Assembly's identification of zoonosis as key threats to human health, especially in newly independent and developing agrarian countries. The committee was tasked with identifying zoonoses that were evident world problems and for which effective control measures existed or could be developed. Over the next decade, it established a standard definition of zoonosis, which brought over 100 different infections under one general category. And the definition was quite simple. Zoonoses are those diseases which are naturally transmitted between vertebrate animals and man, sick humans. It's worth noting that all the zoonoses prioritized were, with perhaps the exception of rabies, infections originating from or affecting domestic livestock, cows, pigs, chicken, sheep, amongst others. Why was this important? It was important because improving the health and productivity of livestock had become an integral part 
of, the, of a UN-wide agenda to tackle the mounting problem of world hunger. The agenda called for massive increases in food production in the developing world. While crops were a major focus, leading to eventually the Green Revolution, so too were livestock, improving their productivity to get greater yields of milk and meat was crucial to addressing world food problems. And this could only be achieved by addressing threats to animal health. Hence, the essential role of veterinary experts uh, in this campaign. Animals affected by zoonosis had long been regarded as costly impediments to production and as transmitters of infections to humans. But their vital role as food sources for hungry humans led to the realization that, in addition, in infected animals produced less food for humans, thus posing a dual threat to human health. So there's a variety of connections that are being made between human and animal health and disease here. And these connections were highlighted um, by one of the committee's leading experts, the Swiss American veterinary scientist, Carl Mayer, uh, in a technical pair paper on the zoonosis in relation to rural health that he presented to the Seventh World Assembly in 1954. I'm not gonna read this whole quote, but I'll just give you a little essence of it. One need only consider all of the adverse effects of the zoonosis to realize the urgency of control. Loss of life, acute and chronic illness of inhabitants of rural areas, loss of life and impairment of productivity of farm animals with all the social, all of the social and economic implications and loss of life and acute uh, life and acute and chronic illness of city dwellers to whom the zoonoses spread. The last line I think is very important here. Um, some of, the, some of the diseases are detrimental to rural populations because of their direct effects on the health of farm people. Some are important in their effect on the world's food supply. Oops, this, um, <clears throat> on the world food supply. In pointing to the complex challenges that zoonoses pose, and especially their connections to problems of food production, Meyer laid out an agenda for positioning veterinary expertise as integral to their control. Tackling zoonoses in developing countries particularly would require extensive technical assistance, close cooperation between physicians, healthcare workers, and, and veterinarians, and between veterinary and agricultural agencies. Now, Kaplan and Dolling, the heads of the, um, the expert, the FAO, the Joint Expert Committee, sought to implement this agenda. Their units coordinated epidemiological studies and basic laboratory research on zoonoses, including the development and standardization of diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines. They invested in technical assistance to resource poor countries that helped them build or expand veterinary services and to train local vets and technicians in how to make and administer biological products for, uh, for zoonotic disease control. At the heart of this integrative approach was a vision of the complex ecology of zoonosis. And again, Meyer provided a framework proposing that the control of zoonosis had to be founded on full knowledge of their ecology. Without comprehensive knowledge, he said, an understanding of the infective agent, its vector, and, if any, and its reservoirs, and their interrelationships, it is impossible to decide on the proper scale of preventative or suppressive measures. So ecology was a frame, but it was also a method for elucidating a complex and variable chain of infection, the control of which started with the animal reservoir. You can see this in, 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 the last, in, in the last quote here. This ecological vision focused approaches on animal reservoirs, both domestic and wild. So let me turn to how it was applied to influenza and to a, a second collaboration between Kaplan's veterinary unit and the uh, the WHO influenza program, which would lead to the framing of influenza as a, uh, as a zoonosis. From the early 1950s, Kaplan worked closely with Anthony Payne, who's the director of the influenza program in Geneva, to coordinate surveys of viruses related to human A viruses in wild and domesticated animals around the world. The role of a new virus in, 1950, in the 1957 pandemic added urgency to these efforts. A viruses related to human strains were soon found in pigs, ducks, horses, chickens, among others. 
On this basis, in 1959, the Joint, the Joint Committee on Zoonosis and, the, and an expert committee on influenza agreed to formally recognize influenza as a zoonotic disease. The big question was whether one or more of these animals played a role in the changes to the virus that cause epidemics and pandemics and how this happened. By this point, flu virologists had distinguished two types of changes. It's important to keep these in mind. One was called antigenic drift, which refers to the small mutations or adaptations in flu viruses already established in infecting populations. And slight changes in a prevailing strain ex can explain why flu infection never produces lasting immunity and why flu returns each year. So that's one, one issue that explains sort of seasonal flu. The other was called antigenic drift. Uh, and this was the big concern. And it refers to the rare instant instances when a new virus suddenly replaces an established type, potentially causing a pandemic because populations have little or no, no immunity against it. Researchers and Kaplan and Payne hoped that both phenomena could be better understood once the natural reservoir was found. And you can see in the, in the quotes I put up here, this is exactly what the focus is of, 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 of the surveys that, uh, that Kaplan and Payne are organizing. Determining the ecology of flu viruses um, was now a priority. Um, and epidemiological surveys scaled up considerably in the 1960s. As Captain Kaplan later re recalled, the surveys covered vast areas and species. The locale, again, I'm not gonna read this whole quote, just gives you a, a sort of taste of, 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 of how widespread these surveys were. The locales where field studies uh, have been carried out, said Kaplan, would satisfy the fantasies of any laboratory worker interested in the natural history of disease. And indeed, they're really covered much of, much of the world. Now, these surveys added um, considerable support to a hunch Kaplan and Payne had that a quote, parent influenza A strain and other pandemic viruses po possibly resided in an animal reservoir on the mainland of China. The idea was really reinforced by the assumption that the 1957 and then the 1968 pandemics originated in China. And it was an idea uh, that would shape zoonotic imaginaries of influenza thereafter. Paradoxically, however, the animal reservoir was not found in China, but on the Great Barrier Reef. In 1972, two Australian virologists, Graham Laver and Robert Webster, announced they had determined the migratory, uh, that migratory aquatic birds were the natural hosts of flu viruses. The announcement heralded a new era of approaches to flu as a zoonosis. Its impact on controlling flu took time, but the implications were huge. Now virus surveillance had to also include wild birds and domesticated animals, such as chickens and pigs, that might serve as mixing vessels or intermediary hosts from which a pandemic virus could spread into humans. The new global ecology of influenza as a zoonotic inf infection started to come into view. New collaborations between human and veterinary medical experts and their organizations slowly gained urgency. WHO reference centers worked with medical and veterinary services, creating large collections of human and animal viruses and sera, which became crucial tools for comparative analyses for sorting out the roles of these viruses in human and animal outbreaks. The event that galvanized action was an outbreak of cases of, of a bird flu virus, the infamous H5N1, in a small number of people in Hong Kong in 1957. The outbreak sent shockwaves and panic around the world. Its emergence in 2003 only added to the, to the fear. Bird flu was now on the global health agenda and spurred intensive pandemic planning over the next decade. The WHO and other agencies highlighted the potential threat countries were hastened to develop and test pandemic preparedness plans in the event that H5N1 or another bird flu virus would require the means to rapidly spread in human populations. Bird flu was framed as both a global public health and biosecurity problem. It underscored the old truism that the health of one country was intimately tied to the health of another, but also a new truism that the health or disease of one species was closely tied to another. 
Over the next 10 years, massive efforts were, pu were put into securing the world against a possible bird flu pandemic. Considerable resources were invested in the capacity of lower mid and middle income countries to participate in flu virus surveillance. Because WHO and FAO experts and most others assumed that the next pandemic would, uh, virus would emerge from Southeast Asia, a number of countries, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, among others, became key sentinels in the system with well-trained experts and equipped labs tasked with tracking and sharing animal viruses. And this facilitated rapid responses to small outbreaks of avian flu in humans and larger ones in growing livestock industries in the region where poultry and pigs suspected of being infected were stamped out. But as anthropologists, Frederick Keck, Lyle Fernley and Christos Lenteris have argued, it's critical to pay attention to how the ecologies of flu viruses were being framed. Rather than focus on massive poultry and pig, pig production facilities that had sprung up since the 1990s as part of so, the so-called livestock revolution, experts and officials focused on backyard producers and wet markets as spaces of viral emergence. Fears about such, site, such, such sites have resurfaced with a vengeance in responses to COVID-19. There were, these were not the only problems um, with the systems developed to tackle avian flu. Asian countries played a vital role in, flu, in, in virus surveillance by freely sharing strains isolated within their borders with WHO reference labs. These strains were then passed on to vaccine manufacturers, but Asia gained little benefit from this arrangement. While viruses were freely shared, vaccines were not. They were still being produced by and for first world countries. And this despite the fact that people in Southeast Asia were most at risk. A kind of flu vaccine nationalism reigned. In 2006, Indonesia sparked a, a crisis when it stopped sharing virus samples, particularly avian flu virus samples. Indonesia argued that the WHO system failed to secure reciprocal sharing of key benefits, particularly access to vaccines. Supported by a number of other Asian countries, Indonesia demanded that the World Health Organization ensure that the benefits of their sharing viruses be more equitably distributed. Now, change did not come quickly. No agreement was in place in 2000, for the 2009 swine flu pandemic, which only deepened uh, uh, developing countries' mistrust because, once again, vaccines were not shared. After four years of negotiation in May 2010, the Pandemic Influ Influenza Preparedness Framework, the PIP, was established, uh, was formally approved rather, by the World Health Assembly. I haven't had time to go into details, but it's fair to say it was a mixed result. It only direct directly addressed vaccine sharing. The framework was not adopted as international law, so it was not legally binding. Developed countries were not obliged or encouraged to donate portions of purchased vaccines. Vaccine manufacturers were or agreed to assist developing countries in exchange for virus samples. Assistance mostly took, uh, took the form of technical support for participation in surveillance with little investment in vaccine capacity. Vaccine manufacturers also agreed to facilitate transfers of pandemic vaccines, but not seasonal vaccines. And crucially, intellectual property rights on vaccines remained protected. Now, as international legal scholars David Fiddler and Lawrence Gostin have argued, while an important step, this framework maintained the status quo on fundamental issues of sharing essential resources for controlling flu. The problem of unequal access to a vital health resource, and thus also in a way who lives and who dies with flu, remained. Let me just conclude, um, fairly lengthy conclusion here, but let me conclude. Let me end with the question I started with. What, if anything, can flu teach us about living with a zoonosis? I hope my snapshot of the global system built to control flu highlights the enormous demands and challenges of living with a zoonotic disease, or rather the ever-changing viruses that cause it and their ecologies. The threat of avian flu spurred or consolidated important forms of collaboration between international organizations, between human and animal, uh, experts and agencies, and new conceptions of the interconnections between human and animal health and disease. They lent these, 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 these collaborations uh, to, uh, they lent considerable purchase to the idea of one health 
that human and animal health and their environments are interdependent. Yet historical perspective on flu should remind us of how hard it has been to adapt to a global zoonosis. International cooperation has been crucial. The role of the World Health Organization and the FAO have been crucial. But questions need to be asked about the interests shaping global health agendas. Controlling flu requires massive investments in science, surveillance, in vaccines, and in healthcare systems. Inequities persist in resources, expertise, and infrastructures required to control a global zoonosis such as flu. And while vaccines are essential to control, capacities and supplies have not been, at least in the long history of flu, shared equitably. These are reasons why flu can be instructive for our future with COVID. They should also teach, teach us how not to live with the zoonosis. Um, we perhaps can do a bit better. Flu's history should also remind us that zoonoses have been, uh, that, that zoonoses have been, fr fr uh, remind us that Zoonoses have been framed as diseases that, at best, we can only try to control through measures like surveillance, vaccination, and culling, with the aim of keeping sickness and death down to an acceptable level. The results have been rather mixed. In high-income high countries, thousands of people still die annually from seasonal flu. The, the WHO estimates that between 500 and 650,000 people die each year around the world mostly outside of high income countries. WHO and FAO recommendations for controlling avian flu have targeted backyard and small scale poultry producers in wet markets. Following these recommendations, uh, governments such as the Vietnamese government have culled millions of chickens. The Vietnamese government uh, called somewhere around 60 million chickens uh, during an avian flu outbreak in 2004, mostly owned by small farmers. Other countries have followed, followed suit with significant effects on small producers. And this has happened despite evidence that large scale commercial operations have, have suffered the biggest outbreaks, that they might be the sources of viral emergence and that the globalized, uh, that globalized livestock systems may be key conduits for the spread of new variants. Efforts to control flu have highlighted but not resolved global health inequalities. Last bit, and then I will stop. Zoonoses are at the forefront of global health concerns, with influenza regularly summoned to demonstrate the need for collaborative and ecological approaches to their control. Such approaches have a history, but also carry assumptions and agendas, and agendas that demand historical scrutiny. If we take seriously the fact that zoonoses were first framed as livestock problems, then, then this means looking at the changing scales and roles of livestock systems. While ecologies of influenza certainly include wild birds in remote places, they are much closer to home in farms, factories, slaughterhouses, and supermarkets, all of which represent, represent crucial sites for understanding and controlling zoonoses. And this brings me to a final question. Should the ultimate goal with COVID-19 um, uh, should the ultimate, should rather, sorry, let me re re restate that. Should control be the ultimate goal with COVID-19 as it has been with flu? Now, as I said, zoonoses have been framed as, as diseases only susceptible to control or mostly susceptible to control and not elimination or eradication. Built into this framing is the idea that a certain amount of sickness and death is acceptable among humans and among animals. The biology and epidemiology of flu in some ways dictates this outcome. Indeed, a certain level of flu morbidity and mortality has become an accepted part of the rational calculus of modern healthcare systems. Is our future with COVID-19, is this our future with COVID-19? It may well be, it most likely is, but it might not be. What would it have meant if the starting point was to make any death or illness from COVID-19 unacceptable? What if the benchmark for the global community was or is, as some have suggested, the elimination or eradication of COVID-19 rather than just its control? Such moral questions should, I think, be front and center when we look to the history of one disease as a guide, a benchmark, or warning for the future of another. Uh, thanks a lot. That's, uh, that's about it. Thank you very much, Michael.
um, there's several comments I want to make, but I I, I will start with the most um, morbid one, where you where you know from where you take your in a sense conclusion, but where morbidity and certain to some extent uh, becomes a part of what you call the rational cal rational calculus of modern medicine. It's a scary, scary thought. And uh, unfortunately, we actually do witness, um, you know, certain quarters actually do, uh, you know, work with that assumption, although it's not articulated in quite this manner. And I think, therefore, um, your perspective as a historian, having looked at this um, in great amount of detail, and uh, I'm, re I'm really, really, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the lecture. Um, it's it. There are several things that came up when you when you spoke, and you know, I think one of the joys of um, one of the joys of of putting together a program of this kind is to not only find the connections yourself, but when you actually find that you know your speakers and your your program make those connections themselves. And we had a lecture by Achal Prabhala, who's an activist for vaccine access, basically globally, and he spoke about he he. He titled this talk a little more uh, provocatively than historians tend to do. So he, he called it um, everything you wanted to know about non-Western vaccines um, and were afraid to ask, where he spoke about, um, you know, the, partially the problem you addressed, but his starting point was not, uh, not yours. So in a sense, your lecture co complements his and his complements yours um, very well, because what he was talking about were vaccines produced in countries other than Europe and America, and therefore what kind of acceptance do they have, including implications for visas to be able to travel, um, you know, and, and just, just you know, how, how the, the, in a sense, the, that network or the establishment, the medical uh, establishment, or the health systems establishment, how it functions globally and keeps certain, um, uh, well, produces certain agents out of that market, right? Like, so his starting point was that, and he he discussed, uh, among others, of course, he, I mean, you know, the Russian and the Chinese vaccines were totally upfront, but also, uh, you know, he discussed others as well. Do start putting in your questions in the Q&A box, please. Um, while I, you know, I, I, I'm still not done with my comments. Um, so it was, it was really nice to, to see, you know, that there is also this other end of it, where, it, you know, where, once produced also um, access to vaccines and access to care and access to knowledge about um, those very diseases which disproportionately actually hit certain parts of the world uh, is still a problem not well defined or managed, right? And so, so it's, it's fabulous that these two lectures have come together. You mentioned Christos Linteris and Christos also spoke uh, in the series. And uh, for those of you- uh, I had to drop his name in. Say that again? I had to drop his name in. I, I mean, because they've done so much work on this as well. But in yes, case, yes, yes, yes. You mentioned another scholar together with Christos. Who was that? Lyle Fernley. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested, we, we are unable to put up Christos's complete lecture online, well, because there are lots of copyright images, and he was talking basically about Im images, right? Um, and um, um, uh, but he has a uh, he has an essay which is a part of the exhibition, along with some photographs. So those of you uh, who are interested, do go and have a look. We also had, um, you know, uh, I mean, um, we have a film uh, by a Vietnamese filmmaker called Lena Bui, which is uh, which looks at farmers in north northern Vietnam who um, cultivate ducks for trade in feathers with China, and. The avian, the context of the avian flu and what it does to the people there, right? So, which is a fabulous film available for for you all to see. Um, but what my colleagues and I would like to remind you is the discussion Lena Bui had with Frederick Ketch, uh, which is also available to see. It's a fabulous, fabulous discussion. Um, so please do have a look uh, at that too. Um, you know. Um, it's and I, this is this last point. I you know I mean I, I I'm sure I sound like I'm trying to kind of market the exhibition. But it's not that it's for me. It's like how how these things have come together, right? Because you, you're talking about all these things and and they're here and they're here to explore. And I think uh, at least for me, I can say that for sure that I'm going to look at all these things with new eyes now, right? Like with uh, with with the depth of your of your research that we had the benefit of listening to. Um, I'm going to approach it differently. And um, it calls for, a, calls for a very different understanding of health system strengthening. I mean, we talk about health system strengthening, but it is not 
ever going to happen at the national level, right? Because these are so hugely shaped and embedded in, a, in an international system where lots of agents, intersect or agencies intersect, including global pharma, the WHO, geopolitics, and, and that there's nothing new about this. I mean, you were able to show us about you know, how that played out in the Cold War, how they played out in the early years of the end of the Cold War, and how that continues. So I, I, I think it, this is just um, absolutely fabulous. And um, I, I think, I suspect many of our, our, our usual suspects who attend the lectures have kind of missed this because this is not the usual lecture slot. It's um, usually 6.30. So yeah. I'm, I'm fairly certain uh, a lot of them are going to come back and make those connections for themselves uh, with the other lectures and everything. So I'll start with the questions because everything, you know, everything I said right now is just at sort of my joy. Um, okay, so and, oh, I'm glad it's John Matthew who's finally speaking up, uh, uh, a colleague of ours. Uh, uh, from a purely biological perspective, what is the advantage of the of establishing the human animal binary? After all, if humans can be the source of diseases in other animals as one among the slew of biological species that populate the planet, shouldn't the whole be deemed zoonosis? So what is at what what is the purchase of looking at it as uh, one directional? What happens otherwise I'll, I'll read the thing and then if you want, I'll break it up also again. Can uh, I address I, the first bit or or do you want to read the whole? Because I, I, I can see it up on. Oh, you yeah, read it up. Oh, you so. can. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a big, it's a lot of question, big questions yes. there. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question around yes. the, 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 this idea of the human animal binary. And of hmm. course, humans are animals. We're, we are, I mean, if, if, if you're a Darwinian, yes. um, uh, and I am, uh, more or less. Uh, the, I think it's important to keep in mind the the early definition of zoonosis that I put up the the, the FAO WHO uh, definition referred to zoonosis as as infections that move between mm -hmm. animals and humans, not from animals to humans. So right. there's there's always been a concept that zoonosis the traffic zoonotic traffic can mo uh, move in both ways. So it's not unidirectional; it can be multidirectional. Um, and it's it's interesting to note that in terms of flu, which I'm most familiar with, and early discussions about it as a zoonotic disease suggested that actually it was humans infected with human flu virus in 1918, 1919, that infected pigs. Hmm. And Richard Shope, who's doing all the work on swine flu, um, developed a theory that, you know, the, that that's, there was a connection between swine and human flu, but it was actually one of, of humans transmitting the virus to, hmm. um, uh, to, to animals. So that traffic is actually, it, it can move both ways. But of course, you know, as a species, if you want to talk about it at the species level, which is problematic, um, we're self-interested um, hmm. and we're interested in our preservation. So um, inevitably, the framing of zoonosis, I mean, there's an idea of being more thinking of us, our, our health and disease as being interdependent with animals and, and our shared environments. But of right. course, we are species, species interested in the preservation of the species at that level um, drives the framing of zoonosis as a problem of uh, animal diseases affecting humans. And hence the organization of much, but not all, work on uh, zoonosis as controlling the movement of, of, of those viruses or pathogens uh, from animal hosts and reservoirs into humans. Sorry, sorry, I just wanted to get that. Yes, first. yes. No, that, that's interesting to know that it started out the same between and therefore then what happens to, you know, there's no there's no petition um, for human diseases being sent. Um, no, and I, I also think that for, 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 for political purposes and financing purposes and what have you, I mean, the reframing it as, as these are threats to human health as, as, as wide purchase and sort of it speaks to um, a lot of agendas, particularly international health agendas, which if you think yeah. of the World Health Organization, it is organized from its inception, for good reason, um, around protecting human health. Hmm. And those collaborations with the with the FAO that it develops is around negotiating the boundaries of, you know, where, where does human health end and where does non-human health, um, animal health uh, begin? Hmm. Uh, and it's negotiating those boundaries. That's actually really, really fascinating and important. My colleagues on the One Health Project, um, yeah at King's uh, and also the anthropologists that you referred to, like Frederick Keck and, um, and Christos, 
Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of work around this question of the boundary. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, are you able to recount examples of diseases that have in fact gone from humans to animals? Are there any notable ones? No, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I will have to think about that. I'm sure there are, and I'm sure a, 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 a zoonotic disease specialist uh, will have some examples. Yeah. examples. I blanked for it on that question. I should have that. Yeah, yeah no, I don't know any either. So, but that'll be good. Let's, let's look it up. Let's look it up. Okay, so I'll read to you the rest of uh, John's question. What happens otherwise is that it is human versus the rest where within the rest, there could be infections with, between other species, but those get black box within the overarching framework of zoonosis. Is the reason therefore solely to be considered at a human societal level vis-a-vis -vis domesticated livestock and onto any non-human species that share diseases with us? Which is your last question. But in terms of that, the, the first bit of that, I don't think um, they, that infections moving between other species has been black, black box in this framework at all. I mean, if, if, if the, the, you know, the classic one would be at least, would be bovine tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. which, you know, moves between certain wild animals, say a badger, um, and domesticated animals like a cow, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, can potentially affect uh, humans living in pro proximity or, or, or perhaps consuming um, unpasteurized milk. So there's a whole chain of infection that can work there. And there's lots of examples of, I mean, br brucellosis would be another, another example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those I mean, I, I didn't mean to sort of suggest that, that it gets black box with the, the domesticated animal connection, I think it's just very important because I think it remains front and center in yeah. terms of our concerns about, about zoonosis. I mean, if, if, if zoonosis were just happening between wild animals, um, there might be conservationists and preservationists might be concerned uh, in yeah. terms of the trade of animals, but again, it's our species interest. L livestock animals are important because we consume what they produce. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it um, can be sort of the infections uh, for those, especially people working closely with them and, and then, you know, they sort of latch onto the sort of, you know, global systems of, of animal food production, then we're getting in trouble, or that's the concern mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. I would ask you a question which I asked. Um, so we had we had Uma Ramakrishnan speak yesterday also about One Health. She's um, an ecologist who basically has been chasing tigers for the last 15 years um, and uh, spends a lot of time in the field. And I'm going to ask you the same question, which is, you know, given that our audiences come from across disciplines, so, you know, they're not even historians of medicine or historians of science, but they're also, you know, from here, there, everywhere. Um, can you help us understand what One Health is, and also kind of give us a background to the concept, um, you know, in, uh, what is the historical context in which it arises, and to what uses has, has it been put, and what, in a sense, is the direction of travel now? Well, first off, I'm going to make a little plug for um, a, a, a chapter that um, uh, Abigail Woods, Angela Cassidy, and I wrote in a yep. in a in a One Health in a book, uh, a textbook on One Health. Yep. Um, so that's a good reference. Uh, yep. If you can send that along at some point, if you if you like. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, it's in, One Health is a concept. This is something that my my colleague uh, Angela Cassidy did a lot of work on. Um, uh, in, is in one sense of really recent uh, provenance. Um, it, it develops in part, as I suggested, out of concerns with uh, things like avian flu and increasing um, recognition of the ways in which um, diseases are caused by anthropogenic changes, and climate change and deforestation, what have you. It, and it coincides with the, at least the One Health concept coincides with increasing concern with um, this new category of diseases, emerging infectious diseases, which gets articulated and, and shaped at the end of um, uh, the 1990s. It, the, mm. There's a very famous report, the Institute of Medicine mm. report in 1992 on emerging infections. And this is a, a spur for the for the consolidation of this concept. But the idea of One Health comes out of another idea, which has a much longer history, which is One Medicine. Yeah. One Medicine, um, I mean, the, the lineage is often traced uh, through um, uh, the work of um, a, a, an American um, 
veterinary scientist, Carl Schwabe, mm -hmm. uh, who was a, uh, affiliated actually with the FAO and WHO committees um, and did various work in, in the Middle East and wrote a very famous textbook, which went through multiple editions on one medicine. Um, and he was a sort of like often viewed to as the, I hate the term, father, uh, as the sort of progenitor of this idea of one medicine that because of our biological connections, because of our many interactions, human, me uh, human medicine can learn much from animal medicine. That human, we can learn much about human diseases by looking at animal diseases and, and much about human health by looking at and vice versa. So if we can go back even further and say, okay, well, this idea goes back to the 19th century. And again, this is my, Abigail Woods has done a lot of work on this, goes back to the idea of comparative medicine, uh, working on, and, and, and thinking about the relationships between human and animal health conceptually. I mean, there's obviously the idea of the animal model is very important, experimental animals is kind of like surrogates or proxies for human conditions. Um, so it has a very, very long history, this idea of One Health. It's become a kind of gal galvanizing um, mm -hmm. force. Um, so a lot of organizations, the World Health Organization, the Animal Health Organization, the FAO signed up and said, let's all work together. And then I, I don't think it's, maybe it's in a way, there's a question of how much the rhetoric translates into action and on the ground. So it's, 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 it's served as a very important way of bringing organizations and some experts together. What's actually happening on the ground? There's still the problem perhaps of silos. Anyways, I'll, that, that's, that's a long-winded answer to a very complex question that requires reading <laughs> and summarizing a lot of well, I think, well, I, think, I think that's a useful answer. I suspect I've found your chapter and I've uh, put a link. Oh, thank you. As well as. Uh, the chapter. So for those of you who are interested, you can certainly download and start reading um, on the material. Uh, there's another question here, which I think does in fact follow from what, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, what, you, what you've said or relates to. In the context of diseases and climate change, are we moving from elimination and control to coexistence in any way? Or is there something more, something else happening? I... <sighs> I, I don't I don't know it, I, what coexistence means in this mm -hmm. in this in this yeah I, mean, I think we've always been coexisting Correct. Correct. Um, the problem is is when the coexistence so there's a I mentioned FM Burnett uh, and um, he wrote a very a short um, book in I think it was 1940 or so the natural history of um, of disease and th mm -hmm. this time mm -hmm. a lot we're interested in the ecology of infectious yeah. disease. Yeah. And he proposed this idea that humans or infections uh, in humans and, 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 and others can reach a sort of a, a kind of homeostasis, a balance, so a form mm -hmm. of coexistence. But this is after a process of a, a adaptation um, mm -hmm. where, you know, on either end of the spectrum, you know, somebody's gonna, something's gonna die, something's gonna suffer. Um, so how do you reach a state of coexistence Mm -hmm. um, this is about, you know, a, a process of biological adaptation, perhaps social adaptation as well. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's with some diseases, and I think flu is a good example, it's a challenge um, because we're dealing with something that is constantly adapting and yeah. probably always ahead of us. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of uh, emerging diseases or, 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 or or um, diseases such as such as flu are um, so savvy um, in yeah. their biological uh, makeup that coexistence. I mean, we are coexisting with. with yeah, yeah, it's it's when people. pathogens arise that you know the problem in a sense manifests. Yeah, and, I mean, you can't coexist with the pathogen. <laughs> no, well, you can at, at, once you but once you it, yeah uh, once you develop the means of control um, and <laughs> in some cases. You know, like with rabies in Britain, uh, a means of elimination. Um, sure. But you know, is I don't know if um, the 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 rabbit animal is so happy with this means of coexistence because, of course, we'll get slaughtered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so the context of the question, right? Like we said, are we moving from elimination and control to coexistence? And I think, uh, frankly, those two strategies are what we have available to us at this moment yeah. in terms of dealing with uh, 
patterns that arise from coexistence um, on this planet. And I mean, there is no, there, there is, how, how should I put it? There is no other, we, we've always been, we've always inhabited the same planet as you rightly started out saying that you know, we have always coexisted. So uh, I trust we've enjoyed listening to Michael. Um, and you know, it's, it's a very, very interesting um, look into the historical past to understand zoonosis as it has played out and has been understood by experts on the ground. But also I think what I found more interesting was the way he managed to connect that uh, history into um, what we are experiencing today and the underlying politics of it. And therefore, I think fundamentally, the relevance of not only his research, but the relevance of this work that is um, that that we all, in a way, need to understand in order to grasp the inequalities um, of access to medicine that we deal with at this moment. So, for that, I think um, you know, especially because he's a professional historian, one should sort of you know, one should take great um, hope from that. You know, good historical work can speak to the present um, as well in in very very interesting ways. And this is that it's not merely a question of lesson, but it's actually about understanding what historical processes feed into what uh, manifest in uh, and manifest themselves into current situations. So uh, Michael's lecture uh, will be available alongside 22 other lectures in our public lecture series on the YouTube channel. So if you want to share this with your colleagues and if you feel like you've missed the previous lectures, uh, do please go check them out. Um, do consider exploring the exhibit Putting Ant into Antibiotics by John Innes Center. Uh, it, it contains, much to my delight, a live stream of an of a ant nest. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's very interesting because what they're studying is the chemical ecology of ants in order to understand uh, their antimicrobial um, responses as a pathway to finding uh, better and better solutions to antimicrobial resistance that is growing in human populations. Um, so uh, yes, so so do look at that as another kind of uh, you know um, way in which we coexist. Uh, do uh, look at Uma's lecture from yesterday, Uma Ramakrishnan's lecture on biodiversity, humans, and pathogens, um, which speaks very well um, to Michael's lecture. And you might be interested in Lena Boy's. Uh, film from North Vietnam, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, the minute Michael finishes lecture, where uh, where birds dance their last is the name of the film, and also her uh, discussion with Frederick Keck, with both of which are available on the website for viewing. To give us your feedback, to register for future programs, as you're all aware, 13th of June is when our intensive programming ends and we enter a new phase for Contagion and its programming. So do stay tuned in for that. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, and thank you very much, Michael, especially for getting up on a Sunday morning and <laughs> offering us your time and um, a wonderful insight into your, into your research. Um, thank you again. And thank have you a for having me. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye-bye.